Hello and welcome to this month's space exploration news, keeping you up to date with the latest efforts to slip the surly bonds of Earth. This month, we are starting our news with Ralph, who's going to tell us all about SpaceX and what Elon Musk has been getting up to. Yeah, first up from me is an update on SpaceX's Starship preparation. It's always worth an update because progress is always so rapid and the ultimate aim of building a fully reusable rocket to lift 100 tonnes to orbit is as revolutionary as the rocket itself. And because the glass is always half full on the good ship awesome, even failure has its positives. We do love mm. a good kablooey. <laughs> and oh, and what a kablooey. <laughs> it was quite a oh, yes. The gods of all things pyrotechnic rewarded us handsomely yesterday. But more on that in a bit. So last month we hedged our bets on the environmental assessment that was hovering over uh, SpaceX, threatening to prevent them from even test launching their Starship booster prototypes at their ever-growing Starbase facilities in Boca Chica. Well, that all kind of went well. They got a mitigated finding of no significant impact, often referred to as a mitigated Fonzie, insert happy days gag here, which <laughs> gives... <laughs> Thanks for not letting me down there. Uh, this gives SpaceX around 75 actions to mitigate environmental impacts before the Federal Aviation, I always call them authority, but it's administration, will issue the license needed to launch from Starbase. Um, as SpaceX go through those, which none of them are too onerous, and some of them are frankly a little bit odd, they're getting everything ready for a full stack launch the moment the license is granted. The latest heat shield adorned Starship top section and the booster section with 33 Raptor rocket engines are both at the orbital launch area going through their final installs before pressure and static fire testing in the next week or so. At that point, we'll have either heard that the FAA have granted a license to launch the biggest, most powerfulest rocket the world has ever seen, or it'll sit there filling up your Twitter timeline while we wait for Musk <laughs> to complete the mitigations. And as we record this, we had a little excitement last night with a big explosion and a visible shockwave during a test of the booster section. Of course, no one was injured. Holy That's lovely. why we can laugh at this. <laughs> I mean, yeah, d to see an actual shockwave, do you know what I mean? Mm, <laughs> it, it was sweet, was wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was it, so it seems that cryogenic fuel under the booster ignited and they're still assessing the damage though nothing was immediately visible by torchlight last night. Musk has already said that they'll be installing a fuel burn-off system like the sparks they used for the shuttle but we just don't know yet if this will delay anything or for how long. My money? I still think we'll be bringing you news of a semi-successful almost orbital launch of the starship in september so the space exploration show will bring you in september or we'll be cooing over one of the biggest non-nuclear explosions the world's <laughs> ever seen because i think it will get the green light to go in the next few weeks and then it'll probably be a couple of more weeks before they're ready to fly especially if there's some significant damage either to the orbital launch mount or to the rocket itself so next up for me is an update on NASA's Artemis moon program, which we left last month in a suspenseful will it, won't it pass its second attempt at a wet dress rehearsal because the stakes on that full up test is the difference between months more delays or certification that it's good to go. Well, it did and it didn't. The wet dress rehearsal last month was a fourth attempt at filling the giant SLS rocket with fuel and running through the countdown to T minus nine seconds to test out everything up to the point you light the engines. The plan was to do everything but launch and thereby certify it as ready for launch to the moon. Which I am so excited about. I know. Because like, Apollo, I was like, you know, it was, yeah. Apollo was long gone before my time. So like, this is my Apollo. So yeah. I, I am so excited about Artemis, even though I know the timelines keep getting stretched out and yep. like, you know, that first landing is pushed further and further back. But 
I like I don't really care because I'm just like so excited to finally see Boots back on the moon, you know? Yep. And this is all preparation for this ultimately crude system to take people back to the moon. Now, the last fuel up attempt of this rocket was in April and it was terminated because of unacceptable temperatures, a leak in a hydrogen supply line, a faulty valve and the need to improve the nitrogen flow to the pad. <laughs> This just, time, just a few little things. Just, then. just, 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 just like, yeah, very yeah, unimportant. But... <laughs> Nothing to see here. Yeah. Um, but this time, the almost day-long test procedure got within twenty seconds of its intended endpoint. Mm. It was fueled and counted down to t minus twenty-nine seconds, and then called off due to another hydrogen leak. Now, this leak had actually been present um, most of the way through the rehearsal, and the NASA team kind of sidestepped it and carried on anyway, but they couldn't get those critical last 20 seconds of tests done as the hydrogen leak would have triggered an automatic abort. Oh, so, so they really were like, oh, there's nothing to see here. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so you would expect that following that, it's kind of back to the building and month of fixtures then, but not really, because everywhere else you look, across the world, up is down and left is right, so why not at NASA? Despite 13 critical automated launch sequence functions not being tested on the day, NASA released a press statement stating it has analysed the data from the wet dress rehearsal and determined the testing campaign is complete. <laughs> the agency <laughs> will roll the space launch system and Orion capsule back to the vehicle assembly building at Kennedy to prepare the rocket and the spacecraft for launch. So it's, it's basically like going, eh, close enough, B minus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just just a, a subtle reminder that this is the agency that launched the Challenger rocket. They, they've shut it. Oh, yes. Mm, you know, yes. Even though the warnings were there. Never, this is an agency that never, ever cuts corners. Never ever, mm -mm. no. Never ever. So there we are. The Artemis 1 stack is now ready to launch in a month-long uncrewed trip to the moon, probably in late August or early September, packed full of 4K cameras, no doubt, and of course, anthropomorphized dummies to measure vibration and radiation levels mm. for the crewed Artemis 2 mission to the moon in two years' time. Two years possible. time before they're sending a crewed mission, and that's just around it's, the moon. I know. Yeah. It's such a uh, like long time. It feels. I know. Yeah, you know, th things can like rust. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two years time. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, so the, so this one is going. The one that's already stacked. That one is going to launch next month or the month afterwards, and then that's gone because none of it is reusable. But then mm. the next one that they stack has got to have all the life support systems for a crew. So that's going to take mm. another two years, you know, that's just the way it works. Mm. But as for those outstanding 13 sequences, most have been tested in isolation, but not in among all the other functions that have to work in a realistic countdown test. So NASA are happy to go ahead. That means more ridicule for NASA if any proved disastrous in the Artemis 1 launch, but they're going to be hailed as geniuses if everything goes well. And I just want to finish this on a quote from Time magazine, because they said, let's just say that if a Broadway bound show had a dress rehearsal, anything like what the SLS has had, the whole production would close out of town. <gasps> Burn. Burn. <laughs> Burn. <laughs> and my summary on this, just like Boeing Starliner in NASA's commercial crew program, the fat lady's singing, but keep your distance, she could blow. <laughs> and I guess it's from one kamikaze freight train to another one that's just hurtling above above the surface of the earth. Take us away, Paul. Right, so, well, first up for me is the weirdness that is the ISS right now. Um, on the one hand, the US government is signing billions of dollars of military aid over to Ukraine to fight Russia. Meanwhile, the US government is arranging seat barters with Russia to allow American astronauts to train and launch on Soyuz and Russian cosmonauts to train and launch on Dragon. <laughs> yeah. Orcs. Just in case you wanted 2022 to get any weirder, 
I have the story for you. So <laughs> as US rockets wind their way to Central Europe to be lobbed at the invading Russian army, US astronauts, including Tracy Dyson, are heading to the Gagarin Cosmonaut Center to train and eventually launch on Soyuz. And while Russia flings every bit of iron that isn't tied down at those US equipped and trained forces in Ukraine, yeah. Russian cosmonauts like Anna Kikina are in the US training to fly on the Dragon. It truly is the upside down. I, I just, just like, <laughs> went, uh, right. So yeah. <laughs> talks continue to keep this arrangement. And while the recent deadline to agree the actual sort of timetable of the next phase passed a few weeks ago, they've now just moved that deadline to the autumn. They're, they're continuing to talk. <laughs> so why, I hear you cry, if NASA have Dragon and very soon Starliner, <coughs> why, by God's tits, do they need access to Soyuz? And likewise, the other way round. Well, it is a safety and redundancy thing. So if for whatever reason, one of the capsule types becomes unavailable, then NASA and Roscosmos always have access to the station or the ability to safely return from the station, if you see what I mean. So it was always a risk using just Soyuz for so long. We, we, they, we took the space shuttle out of service and just ran with Soyuz. And if you remember the shenanigans a few years back when there was supply rocket failures all over the place, and yep. then Soyuz MS-10 with a crew on board aborted after launch. Mm. We've all, all forgotten that already. Yeah, that yeah. was four years ago. That was 2018. Is it really four years ago? Yeah, I know, exactly. There was serious talk of having to abandon the station, if you remember at the time, or minimally crewing it, etc. There was yeah. sort of all these discussions yeah. like, what's going to happen? Well, since Dragon joined the party, it's now been possible, like it was in the shuttle days, to have this sort of mutually beneficial seat barter arrangement yeah. that, that gives this redundancy. So that means both main parties can keep crew on board and that knowledge of capsule systems is shared. So should emergency situation dictate, you know, you can mm -hmm. use each other's capsules and things. Yeah. Um, so here we are with a weird parallel world of NASA and Roscosmos still talking, still trying to cooperate, still sending each other crew to train and launch. With September launches of Dragon Crew 5 and Soyuz Expedition 70 seemingly still going ahead, respectively, with American and Russian crew swaps. I know. Crazy, crazy, crazy. <laughs> it, must, it must feel strange up on the ISS right now. You know, the, the astronauts are up there. Because I, I know that they do their best to sort of keep politics out well, of science. But you it's... say that. We had the whole um, thing that NASA's actually complained about, and uh, the US government's complained about, where Russian cosmonauts um, were displaying the flag, I think it was the Donbass region, uh, the, or, or the, the Russian flag of the Donbass region, where mm -hmm. they, they were sort of, you know, essentially like declaring victory in that bit of Ukraine, and they, they sort of did a big thing from space. So it is really weird, because, mm. yeah, I mean... It it's just like this really weird symbiotic relationship isn't it that like we know we've talked about it on the mm. show before where you can't just have the us running the iss you can't just have no. the Rus russians yeah. running the iss like they need each other and exactly. i i mean as long as the war in ukraine continues it, it's gonna be like this it's gonna it, be this is weird really weird essentially Utopia. america and russia are in a kind of de facto proxy war yeah i mean it is a proxy war that's going yeah, on yeah completely it, it's it's like you know back in the days of vietnam you know the cold mm. war and it, it, essentially america was fighting the soviet union and china in in, in vietnam via fighting in, in the north vietnamese so it, it's weird it is really strange and but as we've said before you know i i hope these channels do stay open because science has always been that kind of channel of peace and cooperation you know even in the depths of the napoleonic wars the great sort of 19th century scientists were still talking to each other mm. you know in france and germany and britain and things like that. they were they were still swapping letters and things like that and that allows progress and that allows that cooperation to to continue because of course eventually peace will come and there has to be cooperation Post yeah war. you yeah. You have to begin somewhere, right? There has to be an do. avenue to start. Like, you, you have to have that first step. Yeah, uh, and... World, War, World War One's the great example with um, the, the, the proof of Einstein. You know, Einstein's theory comes out during, essentially during World War One, and then it's the, the British that essentially provide the first evidence that it's true straight after World War One. So, you know, 
these channels need to kind of stay open. But it is weird. It is very weird. And you do wonder how long it will keep going given the events in Ukraine. So yeah. we wait and see. Anyway, from the sublime to ridiculous with me, because next for me, I thought I'd check in with Beardy Branson. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and how things are progressing at the suborbital fairground ride that is Virgin Galactic. Well, you may have noticed that since the less than stellar first ride where the FFA, 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 FFA. That, that one, we, we, we're struggling with FFA a, a tonight, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> we're just, we'll just call it far we're, from now on. Far. <laughs> yeah. Far, where the, uh, where the FAA eventually had to investigate, if you remember, about sort of them mm. going out of parameters yeah. and the flight space and things like that. Well, um, what had gone on, uh, uh, that nothing had been launched, um, things seemed pretty quiet over in Virgin Land. So what's gone on? This is, you know, let's, let's go and explore. Well, this has been for a couple of reasons and they're all related. So first off, they'd been planning to start their regular flights this year, um, mm -hmm. but various things have got in the way and eventually they put their hands up and decided that 2023 would be the year. So why is this? Well, according to their chief executive, Michael um, Colgazia, there have been a multitude of supply chain and personnel issues experienced uh -huh. over the last year. So on the supply chain issues, um, there have been um, sort of problems with getting certain components. So they've had several high performance metallic components that they're struggling to source particularly those made with carbon composites. And the lead times of what was a couple of weeks have now become months to right. get the components. So in terms of personnel, they've been hiring lots of new engineers to expand the operation. But of course, not only does this have a disruptive effect itself, if you bring new personnel in, you've got to train them and, and mm. get them into post. So that, that's always going to be struggle when you expand an organization. But the hirings, the number of hirings are not keeping up with the demand. They're not actually getting enough people. So, oh. yeah, so what new personnel they do have are at the moment going directly to the improved Delta class spaceship that they're building, which is the next class of this, this ship they're doing. Or they've been involved in building a third spaceship of the current type, uh, which is called Imagine. Uh, a process that, of course, does nothing to improve any of the issues on the current craft, Unity and Eve if all your engineers are off doing other things. Yeah. So along with these issues is the mothership White Knight 2. That is, would you believe it, 14 years old. Whoa. Whoa. I know. It first flew in 2008. Wow. I know, exactly. Nice. You realise how long this process of, of yeah. Virgin Galactic has been. It's actually quite an old aircraft. So what this means is it's seeing poor availability rate due to obsolete components and aging components, you know, it's getting old. Um, and this has resulted in the grounding of White Knight 2. So it can undergo a long period of maintenance and upgrade in order to improve its flying rate and availability and, and reliability. Wow. Um, so essentially, it's all gone a bit wrong for them this year. So following on from that kind of less than perfect first flight, They've now not been able to sort of repair things, build new things. Mm. It's taken time to, to fix, make the fixes. And then their main kind of way of getting into space, which is this big four engine plane that carries the rocket, is basically grounded at the moment. So what this ultimately led to is the announcement this month that Virgin are ordering two new motherships um, to enter service from 2025 to replace White Knight. Um, mm. This will, of course, be a longer term solution to reliability issues and support the larger, more advanced Delta class. Uh, the order is with Aurora Flight Services, which is a subsidiary of Boeing. Ah. You know, well, oh, well, Boeing. We'll see, we'll see how that goes. Um, and is, oh, don't watch our video on that. <laughs> yeah, and mm. is based, based in Columbus, Mississippi, and Bridgeport, West Virginia, where in both those places they're going to build the components of the aircraft. And then final assembly will be at Virgin's facility in Mojave um, Spaceport in California. There will also be a third vehicle built, but this will be a ground test vehicle. Um, and that will mean the flight vehicles will not need to be um, sort of grounded for tests on the ground and ground tests and training and things like that, which is what happens at the moment. So White Knight gets kind of right. used on the ground as well. So that's a much a big improvement on the current situation um, because White Knight spends a lot of time in the hangar 
basically yeah. where they're integrating the rocket. So if they have a, a ground test article, they can do all the integration stuff and you make sure things fit on that and not have to take the two flying examples out of service. Mm. So in a sense, this sounds like lessons are being learned and that the whole operation is moving from its sort of seat of the pants development phase into this more serious and kind of viable setup yeah. that by the second half of the decade will probably be a regular part of the world sort of launch setup that will probably, I, I'm guessing, start to fill this kind of important niche in that kind of microgravity uh, small launch world along with sister company Virgin Orbit um, and they're talking about you know it's not just a fairground ride I'm being mean with that but you know the, mm. they, they can take payloads as you would with a sounding mm. rocket for instance to that kind of edge of space doing microgravity experiments things like that and that's where this you know I think this is going to go yeah. and it does sound like yeah. they're, they're finally getting somewhere after a very very difficult period yeah interesting though that they're relying on Boeing Mm. Well, yeah, indeed. I mean, it's a subsidiary that they did buy, so it's it's technically not directly Boeing. Mm. Aurora Flight Services were set up years before, and Boeing have bought them because they wanted to be part of their portfolio. But it, you know, it's linked to Boeing. Boeing exactly hasn't exactly had a, a great track record of late. Mm. And also, you know, competition for their oh little hops to the edge of space yeah yes mm, interesting but at least now it looks like virgin galactic are actually trying to think about the future and make the company sustainable they're not yeah. just trying to like grab the cash cow and milk it for all yeah. that they're going to get for for one or two years you know so it, it's kind of nice forward thinking i think so i think there, there was an impression in the last few years where there's it, a bit of a cowboy element to it it was a bit of that kind of it, yeah. it never felt like entirely, if I, I might be being really mean, but a, a completely serious operation. It was all kind of in a very Richard Branson way, that kind of bit fly by night, kind of just, you know, yeah. go for it. And, and actually, it sounds like they're now getting far more serious about it. And, and mm. you yeah, know, I think we're going to see big differences there in the, in the second half of this decade, certainly. So then, to our final big news story mm. of the month, we are actually taking another journey back to the moon with a seemingly rare problem for NASA because mm. you, you don't really hear about NASA having missions go a little bit wrong. And yeah. we're talking, of course, about Capstone, which yeah. was uh, recently launched to go to the moon. And NASA actually lost communication with the craft for a little while. So I think uh, Ralph's going to take the lead on this one and tell us what on earth's going on. Yeah, I'll give you a bit of background to start with. So this capstone is a, it's a funky little mission mm. where NASA mm. is helping more of those new space, those commercial spaceflight companies to grow and gain valuable experience with a mission in the big time, essentially. Um, and this is part of the Artemis program. In this case, the companies are Tyvac, who are producing the 25 kilogram conglomeration of CubeSats that makes up the main uh, satellite itself, Stellar Exploration Inc, who are providing the propulsion and Rocket Lab, who launched it on their Electron rocket. And this is a really cool, low-cost mission at just $13 million, and that is nothing for a NASA no. mission. Peanuts, isn't God, it? No, yeah. especially going all the way to the moon. Yeah, exactly. And, and you uh, know, uh, this is also yeah. part of that yeah. thing about showing that CubeSats can be greater than the sum of their parts and mm. that they can do these big missions. Mm. And I also think it's probably worth highlighting that isn't this the first time the Rocket Lab have launched anything to the moon as yes. well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes, it it's is. a really momentous and occasion for I was say, you it, know, it's Rocket really Lab. it's really interesting that it's um the first use of one of these smaller rockets in recent years to, to fly a, a what's yeah. a deep space mission. Mm. So normally, you know, you think about a lunar mission, you you're talking about something, you know, beefy. You know, in yeah. that kind of less like Falcon Nine kind of category, something nice and big to you know thump a satellite out there. But this is this is a tiny little rocket. This is one of these small kind of launchers that are coming online at the moment. And actually, the, yeah. the Virgin Electron is the, the kind of thing that's going to fly in the UK soon. Yeah. So mm. it's really interesting stuff that you know we're having to launch kind of lunar missions with these smaller things, not from 
um, standard launch sites either. You know, this is going. This went from yes. New Zealand, so yeah, yeah. it's very yeah. exciting. And and this is part of the bigger program. I'm not wanting to go down too much of a rabbit hole, but this is part of the bigger program mm. that Peter Beck's got for Rocket Lab, wanting to send yeah. missions out to Venus. And I think he's already got paying customers for sending payloads out. And of course, you can do that on smaller rockets, mm. less mm. powerful rockets. If you've got, if your payload is smaller and it's being miniaturized, so CubeSats are quite quite often seen as being the kind of poorer relative, but actually. It's miniaturization. It's actually sexier in a way mm. than those bigger um, those bigger satellites because now you can do things with much smaller satellites that you know 20, 30 years ago you would have need something gigantic and at ten times the cost. But anyway, this one is going to be the first spacecraft to go into a theoretical orbit around the moon called a near rectilinear halo orbit. And this orbit provides a really stable lunar orbit for communications. And it's due to be the orbit that the lunar space station will go into as a staging post for the Artemis moon program. So gateway. Gateway, <laughs> exactly, yeah. So in, in an ever slipping timeline next decade, there's going to be a space station around the moon that will serve to transfer astronauts and deploy robots to the surface for lunar exploration. So it's a really good idea to send something <laughs> into this orbit to confirm that the maths work and test navigation mm -hmm. systems and comms for this orbit. And the spacecraft was launched on the 28th of June on that Electron rocket, which isn't powerful enough for a direct transfer, like Paul was saying, to this elongated lunar orbit. So it takes a more sedate and propellant efficient three months, just gradually increasing the size of its orbit. And once there, it's going to spend six months gathering data. But it's already given us a few heart palpitations. Hasn't <laughs> it? it just? <laughs> yeah, because they just completely lost communication with it. Not yeah. too long after it was launch. It was just, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was gone. It was gone. And um, well, I mean, I, I joked the, well, when they said, oh, well, they still know where it is. And it's like, well, yeah, they will know where it is because yeah. it, they'll be able to name the crater after it when... Um, <laughs> yeah. they, they, yeah. when I mean, with they, radar, in, you can track you can track satellites. You know, they, they track the, the Russians tracked the Apollo mm. craft all the way to the moon. But that's, it's a very different thing being able to track it from <laughs> being able to communicate with it. Yeah. yeah. And, and there was, it was, a, it was a long period of time where it just seemed to be gone it was dead and something had gone wrong um yeah but they got it back got it back yeah it, they got it back it's in that, that kind of brilliant problem solving they managed to get c the communications back with it and it got got it back online and the mission proceeds yeah uh, almost as though it's unaffected yeah yeah it's almost like it never happened there yeah. doesn't seem to be any any other issue and uh, no problem yeah. um but I've noticed little things like this have started to creep into NASA missions. So, you know, we talked about the, the Artemis dry run and they've just kind of glossed over some of the things not actually being tested. And also, I'm pretty sure it's the Lucy spacecraft that like one of its solar panels hasn't yes. fully unfurled. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And now, you know, we lost the capstone, you know, satellite cluster and it's like, Ooh, I, I don't know. It's it's a little bit like, hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure Boeing had anything problems. to do with any of those, if that's a, a conspiracy theory in you know, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. No, not Boeing's fault. But I'm just like noticing these sort of like little errors creeping in with NASA. We're, we're not yeah. used to sort of things it, it, going wrong with NASA. Well, you say Maybe that, you Mars know, we've missions. had like the metric imperial issue in the past and yeah. we've had, you know, missions that crash into Mars rather than landing on them. But... And so I it, think it, we do have those problems a lot, but NASA are really good at fixing them. And it, it could also be that confirmation bias thing of, you know, you, you notice you notice the errors. Uh, yeah, That's you notice, true. You yeah. notice the errors far more than you notice the su successes, because the successes just happened, and then you go, oh, look at the results. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah that's very true. when there's a bit of drama, we all go, oh, look, it's all going wrong at NASA, yeah. isn't it? Because, look, you know, they've, 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 lost, yeah. they've lost communication with us. Oh, no, they've got it back. It's all right. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, that, that's the same with SLS, isn't it? It's that... Um, we, we notice every little fault. We're yeah. noticing all the little faults, all the little problems. But actually, all rockets have massive. I'm Christ, you know, look what happened to SpaceX just just yesterday with the with yeah. The, if that was <laughs> happening to the rocket. SLS, people would be like, "Oh, this is you know, this is a boondoggle. It's never going to work." Yeah. Whereas because it's mm. Elon Musk, people love it and it's wonderful. And it's let's hope this is nothing serious and get oh, straight yeah, back it's on like, it. Oh, yeah. it's fine. It's fine. The, the launch pad. Musk. 
the launch pad's on fire, but that's probably just him testing something out. <laughs> yeah. you know? yeah. Whereas if, if NASA had done that, everyone would be like, right, scrap NASA, cancel yeah, the whole yeah. thing, <laughs> shut it all off, <laughs> shoot the administrator. Um, and and, and that's, that is part of the problem, isn't it? That, yeah. that mm. we noticed the errors. Yeah. Um, and there they are. There's been some big errors, like the metric problem with, um, which one, that was Mars, I forgot which Mars mission that was. Yeah. Where it, um, burnt up in the atmosphere, didn't it? Um, mm. But, yeah, I mean, we noticed, but then, you know, think of all the successes and think of all the successes that are going on now. So, but I know what you mean. You know what I mean? There, there seems yeah. to have been little creeping kind of small errors. Yes. I know what you yeah. mean. I know what you mean. Yeah. It's that, that kind of little, like, not, ooh, No that catastrophic doesn't... failures, you know, nothing smashing into the surface yeah. of the moon just yet. Yeah. But it's just, yeah, these little things that they're having to go in and, and fix and, and sort out and, yeah. you know, unexpectedly. Yeah, I, I do feel that with with this one, it's kind of to be expected because they are, as I mentioned at the top of this news story, they're, they're punting on these smaller companies that don't have mm. the pedigree in space, and they're, they're yeah, that's you know true. they're getting into the big time now. What's really surprised me is how few issues there've been with things like mm. um, Crew Dragon going to the International Space Station. Now, I know yeah. they've had issues with they had an issue with a toilet on the Inspiration Form <laughs> mission, which yeah. nobody spoke about. Don't talk about the toilet yeah. in space. We do not uh, don't talk about the toilet. They were swimming yeah. in shit for three days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The camera shut off there. Yeah, they they weren't um, they weren't bouncing around with the food in there and, and showing off the bubbles in the air. But um, the I think they also had an issue with a um, uh, with a, a some leak in the in the capsule as well. But mm. you know, it's given that these are really new craft being tried out. Mm. You know, mm. it's surprising they're not going through all the faults yeah. that Starliners seeing. I think yeah, anyway. We, we we've said this before when we talked about um, SLS and, and SpaceX things. You you think about you compare it to like aircraft and things like that. Mm. You. They go through years of testing, and there's all sorts of errors mm. where you know the, yeah. the pilots have to abort and you know land and go right. Okay, that didn't work. This, this yeah. bit's falling off. Yeah, yeah. It, it, so it, it's it's amazing actually how rockets are so bloody successful. Yeah, given that they don't fly yeah. very often, you actually think about the number That's of flight true. tests that go into say you know you think like the F thirty five. You know, everyone there's a big sort of world of F thirty five hate. But the F-35 has been developed for years and years and years. It's flown thousands and thousands of hours. I mean, mm. hundreds of test pilots. Falcon 9, you know, it, it's flown really compared to just barely out of a test program from a, a sort of yeah. aeroplane point of view. Yeah. And SLS, well, you know, had yet to fly. So, yeah. you know, this is next a month. prototype. Next yeah. month. Mm. Hopefully. But I think actually you nail, hit the nail on the head earlier when you were talking about how we're now seeing these little companies flying under mm. the guise of NASA. Yeah. And like we're forgetting that they aren't just NASA like born and bred projects. They're, they're newbies, you know, new yeah. kids on the block who have never been to space before. Yeah. So Being incubated you know, you as space that, companies. Yeah. And and there's a lot yeah. of off-the-shelf components being used as well. That's, that's mm. one of the big yes. drives at the moment is to use stuff that isn't so sort of specifically and expensively developed just for the mission and so just that for bringing space. the cost down it's to try and mm. bring the cost down that's why this mission is 13 million dollars it's because it's, which is it, astonishing it is mm -hmm. astonishing you know and it's using lots of off-the-shelf stuff that, that just already exists and the problem there is you then got that risk element that the stuff isn't developed for space or this particular mission mm. yeah and so actually it is a big test it's you know does this stuff work can we can mm. we get this stuff to operate yeah. in this environment so with that, we will come to the end of news. So let us know what you think about any or all of these news stories in the comments below. And then there will be more from us next week. So until then, it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Hey. <laughs> you got a Fonzie in. Got Fonzie. <laughs>